Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Vita Health. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available. So feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion, and we will get to those at the end. Afterwards, stay on to unwind and take a mental break with yoga instructor Stephanie Wallace. And with that, I'll throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Med City News, Orinduti Parmar. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who's attending today. Again, my name is Orunthuti Parmar and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Med City News. I'm joined today uh, by, uh, with Stephanie Telenius, who is the CEO and founder of Vita Health. Ilana Schrader, she is the Senior Vice President of Healthcare Services and President of Guidewell Health. And finally, we have Jason Parrott, he is Senior Manager of Global Healthcare and Wellbeing for Boeing. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to join on video, but he will obviously be answering all the questions that I sort of sent his way. Uh, so Stephanie, let me start with you and sort of the, the crux of our discussion today. You know, Eastern medicine has long treated the whole person instead of one physical malady or another. Are we finally seeing a shift in the US that the physical and the mental are sort of inextricably tied? I think we are in this unprecedented global pandemic, you're seeing a lot of demand for mental health. So we typically, we have a polychronic virtual care solution. We typically uh, roll out to an employer or a payer and handle multiple conditions. And when we work with these companies, we'll get an eligibility file and we'll see that maybe 15 to 20% of the population has a mental health condition. And now in this unprecedented time, we're literally seeing 60% of people have depression uh, you know, through a PHQ assessment or 45% have anxiety. And so we're seeing an escalation during this difficult time. I also think even before COVID, there was a shift and a recognition that you can't treat the physical health without treating the mental health. And if you just look at the statistics in our country, you know, 90% of our healthcare spend is on chronic disease. And uh, one in um, typically about 40% of people have one condition and then 60% have multiple, uh, if you look at co-occurring chronic conditions between mental health and physical health. And you know those individuals in our country who are living with diabetes and depression are the most expensive in our system and it's the most expensive for them to handle these chronic conditions. And so uh, you know, mental health is now really being considered, uh, the stigma is being removed and people are really accepting the fact that it is truly uh, it needs to be treated, it needs to be front and center in the conversation. Uh, you're certainly seeing in the millennial generation all of them are embracing, uh, are really open to mental health. So traditionally in our country, you've seen stigma, cost and access be a problem. And all of those are being removed during this time. And we certainly have been at the forefront of that, really trying to make it easy for people to get immediate access, reducing the stigma by making it a one-on-one -on -one conversation in a mobile app and making it really easy to use. And I think we're seeing, a, you know, now Medicare just came out and acknowledged that, um, teletherapy is going to be reimbursed at the same rate as for you know, offline therapy. And so I think you're really seeing the country embrace the need for this. Can you also break down just a little bit uh, about your text capability? If I'm a patient, uh, if I'm a user today and I've just lost my job and I'm anxious about the future, I also have diabetes or some other chronic condition, what kind of resources are available, available to me using, uh, when I'm using the app? Absolutely. So we will uh, we'll provide, if you have diabetes and anxiety, for example, we will provide you uh, with a, an integrated care plan. So we'll first enroll you either, it, probably mostly in a diabetes management program, we'll give you a registered dietitian or a certified diabetes educator. You'll have a, a digital therapeutic intervention, which is a diabetes management program. And, it, and that program will vary depending on your severity. So if you are on insulin, it will be different than if you're on oral med or metformin. Uh, and so you'll, you'll have the diabetes intervention at the same time we'll administer uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and you'll enroll in a cognitive behavioral therapy program. You'll have a, a dedicated therapist and you have text, audio and video with these providers. We'll ship devices to your home like a glucometer or scale or Fitbit, whatever is required for your set of conditions. Mm -hmm. And over the period of 
many months, you'll start to see real outcomes. And, you know, we're really, we take an evidence-based approach and we measure how you're doing. We'll measure your glucose changes, your A1C, your weight loss. Uh, you'll, you'll look at um, your PHQ or your GAD over time. And so typically someone with those kinds of um, conditions, you'll see they'll, they'll drop their A1C by over a point over three to six months, they'll start to lose significant weight and maybe anywhere from five to 10% of their body weight in a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for depression, we typically see, or anxiety, we typically see about a 50% reduction in those conditions in six months. And in, in longer periods, in nine months, we'll see an 84% reduction in depression, a 72% reduction in anxiety. So we'll provide really a provider, a digital therapeutic, the devices, and the ongoing continuous care to really manage these conditions in a much lower cost way than traditionally is done offline where people are going to the ER or going to doctors all the time. And this is something that can be done in a different capacity on a continuous care model. Okay. Uh, Jason, I'm going to come to you now. Um, Boeing has deployed uh, Vita's chronic disease and mental health platform now for almost a year uh, to the majority of your U.S. employees. What kind of results are you seeing in terms of outcomes? Yeah, great question. And um, up to this point in time, we have many people enrolled in many different programs offered through VITA, ranging from physical to preventive to mental health solutions. So, for example, we have many uh, employees and dependents that are enrolled in weight loss, as well as diabetes, as well as depression. And what we've seen is bringing that all in one is delivering higher outcomes when the people combine the physical and the mental health needs in, in one session. Uh, for example, we have users who have seen a 50% reduction in depression and an 11% reduction in weight loss and more than one point reduction in A1C in a three to six month time horizon. The biggest cohort where we have data from is in the mental health space. And we've seen a 50% reduction of depression and anxiety at six months and an 84% reduction in depression and a 72% reduction in anxiety at a nine month interval. So all around really good results, but the whole point is bring it all together. Let's not operate in fragmented silos like we traditionally have approached it in the past. So I'm going to have you sort of clarify a point for me. I personally understand how you can measure weight loss, those are, you know, uh, concrete numbers. How do you measure 50% reduction in depression? What's the metric you're using? Yeah, I'll, 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 get, I'll take a shot at this and, and share some insights. And certainly Stephanie can as well, because her team's really crunching the numbers for us on an ongoing basis. But we, we actually establish a baseline of where our members are at across all modalities, whether it's chronic, preventive, or physical. And from that point on a go forward basis through their customized personalized plan that's administered directly from Vita, we have ongoing checkpoints over the course of, you know, that the, the, the program that they are enrolled in. And it really does vary. But over time, we absolutely provide a strong set of quantitative analytics on all fronts to capture what the outcomes truly are. Because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter if we can't measure what, what we're trying to manage. Stephanie, I'll come back to you in just a little bit. I wanted to move from the employer perspective sort of to the provider and payer perspective. So Ilana, um, where Jason has been using this for almost a year, you're fairly new to Vita's platform, right? You um, deployed in a pilot in late March, just as COVID was starting. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your selection process. Clearly, there's no dearth of companies in this space. Um, there are companies that are public. There are other companies in Stephanie's backyard in San Francisco. So just wanted to get a sense from how you ended up with Vita Health. Sure. You know, the first thing I would say is that as a company, we are very strong advocates of collaboration. So we um, are very well aware of what our sweet spots are and what our strengths are. And really believe that strategic and strong partnerships with other entities that have um, strengths in other areas are the best partners. And so there comes Stephanie and Vita, and, um, and we had just a great um, chemistry uh, between uh, the individuals um, uh, uh, 
uh, who are leaders in both companies and uh, certainly the uh, mission of Vita aligns very, very closely with ours. And, um, you know, the Vita approach to the holistic patient and the holistic care um, of individuals uh, is exactly what we're all about as we um, live by our mission to improve the health and well-being of our communities. And um, so it was a great, it was a great marriage. But very specifically, you know, as, as this discussion has already um, revealed, um, truly, you know, when, when we would uh, traditionally look at companies that look at various chronic illnesses, first of all, they're often one chronic illness at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but understanding that there are uh, co-occurring chronic illnesses and that in many, many, many instances, those chronic illnesses, uh, those chronic physical illnesses are accompanied by chronic mental illness as well um, is really important to us and how Vita goes about um, attacking that and addressing those issues was um, very much in line with how we see uh, the approach that is necessary. So Stemi, I'll come back to you again. If you could again pinpoint a little bit more for us how you are measuring the reduction in anxiety and depression. I think that's really key. Sure, I'm happy to talk. You know, typically when you look at um, the way therapy or mental health has been administered in our, in our country for, for decades now, there hasn't really been strong measurement. And what the advantage of these digital therapeutic and virtual care interventions now is we're bringing real data to, to, and not just us, but all, you know, every company I hope in this space is using metrics. And so we use traditional um, evidence-based metrics that they use in hospitals. Uh, PHQ is a, is a, a measure for depression. Uh, GAD is a measure for, measure for anxiety. We also, um, we have a myriad of other measurements. We look at the therapeutic alliance and whether the relationship between the therapist and the individual is actually working. We look at PAM scores, patient activation measures, which are often used in hospitals. So we will, throughout the product experience, if you come in and you start with a therapist, we'll assess your level of depression at the starting point. And then every two weeks, we are administering new uh, surveys and tests to understand where you're at. And we do this throughout the experience so we can show the reduction in, uh, in the anxiety or depression, as an example. Uh, and we're really trying to take an evidence-based approach because we believe that uh, you can intervene with a series of uh, text, audio, and video sessions with a therapist, and then you can really reduce the um, the incidence of the condition, and then you can stop therapy, right? Whereas in the in the past in our society, there's this impression that you keep going with a therapist for a very long period of time, and you're not sure you get outcomes. And what we're saying here is, no, we, we're actually going to get outcomes. We're going to measure outcomes. We're going to really make sure that this is an efficacious, effective intervention. Got it. Jason, I'm going to come back to you once again. Um, you know, employers have been investing in sort of benefit management programs. Uh, obviously, Vita Health is different from that because it's it is a, you are providing it as a benefit, but it's not. It's focused on chronic disease squarely and their mental um, challenges that come along with those diseases. But from an employer perspective, do you see these sorts of benefits programs? as a tool to retain employees are you at, or are you actually seeing a lowering in your healthcare costs or is it too early to ask that question? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. And I would say philosophically and strategically, you know, we've historically looked to bring innovative solutions to benefit our members as a hook to retain, attract and retain top talent. So starting there, that's, that's the premise. And then over time, what we've, certainly try to aim for is demonstrated proof that we can make a difference by impacting trend on medical and pharmacy and mental health in, in a positive way. Um, what we have been able to, um, I would say, quantify over time is um, uh, definitely a decrease or, or a medical cost savings outcome that's, you know, I, in a good way, impacted our, our trend. So when we think about, you know, those members that might have diabetes, for example, if we're able to lower their A1C level one full point and get them below a seven, you know, let's face it, they're going to have fewer emergency room visits and hopefully fewer hyper and hypoglycemic events. So managing that condition better almost has a multiplier effect 
in a good way to the other comorbidities or health conditions, whether it's mental or physical, that they might also try be trying to uh, better manage as well. So overall, you know, it's, it's, it's a positive, uh, you know, not just on the individual's quality of life, but also we do see that correlation based on the quantified uh, medical claim cost savings that we yield over time. And then again, from an employer perspective, are you, what we hear when we talk to hospitals is that they really are, you know, reluctant to use point solutions. They want to go to a vendor that can provide multiple things. Um, when you look at your employee healthcare costs, uh, are, are you deploying more point solutions or you'd rather go to someone like Vita that has the ability to manage multiple chronic conditions and take on mental health as well? Yeah, I, I, I would say from our perspective, you know, with the, the beauty of the Vita model really brings it all home and gives me greater optionality and flexibility to at least seriously contemplate do I want to simplify my vendor mix and simplify the patient or member experience and not overwhelm them with multiple solutions? So at the end of the day, when I think about the, the breadth and depth of preventive, chronic, and mental health solutions that Vita can offer, um, I have many different vendors for narrow focus solutions. And you know, I, I now have a real opportunity to think about you know, possibly migrating you know, into one common digital platform provided by Vita to benefit my members and not have to point them in, you know, 12 different directions to get what they need. I, it, it can all come down on, onto one, one platform that Vita offers today. Okay. Dottie, can I jump in for a second? Um, you know, I know it's early. Our pilot just started right at the end of March, but we're seeing um, already really significant, significantly positive engagement results mm -hmm. and are seeing those same kinds of data that Stephanie mentioned, which is that about 60% of our patients who are being engaged are uh, reporting depression. Um, and over 40% are reporting anxiety. And we have at this point, um, not good statistical data yet, but really um, very powerful anecdotes about how just the intervention of somebody, a nurse, uh, a caregiver, a provider calling that person, uh, what a big, huge difference that makes. And I think that's really important. And as we talk about you know, the, uh, the comparison between having programs that are fragmented, which uh, means that it's going to be very hard to reach uh, individuals um, in, in that holistic way. And most people are not going to answer multiple phone calls from multiple different uh, companies or, um, or uh, p potential providers. They're just not, right? So we'll only always address, you know, one uh, silo or fragment of the individual. So having it um, together and sort of synergized and fluid um, really, I think, is going to make a huge difference in terms of ultimate outcomes. So, uh, yeah. That makes a lot of sense, Alana. I, I wanted to mention to uh, the attendees listening in that you can uh, chime in through the chat and Q&A function and um, ask some questions, and I will try my best to sort of incorporate it as we move along. So back to you, um, Stephanie. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about virtual care as we are seeing it. I mean, during COVID, everyone talked about how telemedicine skyrocketed. Um, but what I've noticed in, in, in our stories and our reporting is that when people talk about telemedicine, at least on the provider side, they just mean video visits, right? Instead of doing the, the, the visit in person, you are just doing it through Zoom or some other, you know, um, HIPAA compliant platform. So just wondering whether that is enough or care, virtual care means something else. That's a, it's a great question. Well, let's just, let's look at what's happening in our country. So let's start with, there is a huge need right now and telehealth um, literally took a decade to go from zero to 5%, I think, market share. Mm -hmm. And then now in the last three months, it's like 40% market share. I mean, to your question, everyone is now talking to their doctor or their therapist or you know, any care provider through uh, video. And, and that's just our new reality. And I don't think we're going to go all the way back. I think it's going to accelerate. I think COVID is essentially an accelerant for what makes 
everything easier. You know, a lot of people don't want to take time off work. They don't want to travel. Um, and so I do think video therapy is a viable uh, path. And we have been doing that for a long time and now it's just accelerating. But combined with that, you need to measure outcomes. And so just getting on video and just having a therapy session without actually having all the tools and the, the, the cognitive behavioral therapy and the other interventions around it, I don't think you get as strong outcomes. And that's what we're doing. So we're measuring, we have a cognitive behavioral therapy program you're having, you get lessons, you get interventions, meditations, other things in the app on a daily basis. You can text audio and video. And the other thing about being able to text in between sessions is if something comes up, you've got someone to talk to. Uh, so I think using a multimodal approach of text, audio, and video, and then having a digital therapeutic intervention with the therapy itself really gets the best outcomes. And I, I, I think you're seeing a, a transition now of, um, you know, first of all, a transition to accepting video therapy as a modality. Uh, and then now accepting the notion of, of really handling your healthcare like we, we do other many other things. I mean, think about, we, we, we shop, we buy groceries, we, uh, we, we watch videos, we do everything on our phones these days, but we haven't solved for healthcare. And this is what we're trying to do is just essentially create an Amazon or Netflix style approach to healthcare for chronic and, and virtual uh, therapy. Okay, so we have a few interesting questions. So I'll start with uh, you again, Stephanie. Um, this is a question from Mary Beth Basu. How much does Vita cost? Well, we uh, we charge employers based on uh, engaged an engaged user. So if someone comes in and they are using the service, uh, we we do charge. We don't actually reveal our pricing uh, openly, but I don't think most most companies working with large payers and employers talk about their pricing like that. Um, but we do have, it's all, it's all evidence-based and it's outcomes-based and we measure medical cost savings and ROI. Mm -hmm. And we only uh, charge for somebody who's actually enrolled. So if you look at the healthcare uh, digital health space, you've tended to see PEPM models and PPPM models. And um, we're, we're pretty flexible. We're open to all of these models. We, we tend to try to focus on PPPM because it's paid per member. We also submit claims. Uh, so we'll submit claims and bill for all of our providers are essentially billable, uh, their CPT codes. So we're pretty flexible on how we, how we bill. Some, some employers and payers just want to uh, align on a PPPM rate. Others want us to bill claims and we'll do whatever works for them. And here's a question to Jason from Simon Block. Um, I apologize, Simon, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Uh, Jason, so Simon is asking, how do employees reporting depression and anxiety keep it confidential from Boeing management? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's certainly a, a, a sensitive topic for, for us when we think about data privacy and, you know, HIPAA and PHI and all, everything that goes with that. You know, I, I would tell you that it's it's the exact same way with how it's been done in the past in a traditional brick and mortar sense. You know, we, we, we do not look at anyone on an individual level basis from a management perspective. We're, it, it's not our business. We're not privy to it, uh, nor do we have an interest to understand that. But the one thing that we are trying to do collectively is provide greater awareness around the tools and solutions and resources that I would say we've even doubled down and made more prominent and provided weekly emotional well-being mental health webinar sessions to benefit any of our employees wherever they may be. And Vita has been a, a key partner for us to facilitate those discussions and webinar sessions, as well as providing on-site physical health coaches and advocates from Vita to our various uh, Boeing sites. So through that, we're, we're really trying to, I would say, break apart the stigma that goes with mental health concerns and also create a greater understanding and awareness that, you know, one in five Americans are suffering from some form of, you know, mental health condition and one in two are going untreated. We, we need to do better. And it all starts with access. So whether you go, you know, the, the mobile route with Vita, which is great because um, you can do it anytime, wherever you are on the go, or, you know, if, if, if some of our diverse, you know, uh, workforce wishes to continue to leverage, you know, the brick and mortar, you know, approach, that's perfectly fine. So we, we try to meet our members wherever they want to be met through a variety of solutions. But Vita, you know, definitely brings it all home in one place when we think about the span across the board. 
Um, this next one is for you, uh, Ilana. Uh, this is a question from Deborah Dabb. Um, what she's talking about, I think it, it fits very well with the whole social determinants of health issue that we are all uh, sort of focused on now. She's saying people who have mental health issues already might be going through a, a bout of depression or anxiety as an example. They may not be interested or motivated to seek care, instead might choose to suffer in silence. What needs to be done to make sure members stay motivated on a course and get help? Um, you know, first of all, we have to, especially in this environment uh, where uh, social separation is necessary to keep people healthy, well, and safe, uh, we've got to find ways to engage. So we, uh, whoever we are, the support system for any individual, our company, uh, any other um, any other resources need to reach out and make sure to keep engaging people who are alone, feeling lonely and isolated and um, depressed and anxious. So outreach is so important. We've got to give people ways to stay engaged um, again in other ways. You know, um, we all have either elderly parents who are alone or um, other people who are alone for other reasons or feeling lonely for other reasons, but programming uh, conversations with their friends or, um, or again, social uh, community resources. I think uh, those kinds of things are really, really important. Encouraging them to, if they can, stay physically active um, if their doctors say that's safe for them. Um, encouraging people to, to keep their minds active you know, there are ways you can do puzzles. You can, you know, there are, there are all kinds of ways uh, to, to stay engaged. Um, sharing with people uh, funny stories, getting them to laugh, uh, reminding them that there's humor in, uh, in some of these um, kind of um, awful and difficult times are all really, really important things to keep people uh, upbeat and their spirits up. No easy task, but uh, obviously very important. So Stephanie, two quick um, questions uh, about your uh, product. One is, uh, does, Vi does Vita provide heart health disease management? And two, is Vita only available through employer or can it be offered through primary care or direct to consumer? Primary care, we know, but direct to consumer, probably not. That's what I know, but correct me if I'm wrong. I'll answer those questions. I just want to pick up on Alana's comments on social determinants. It's really yeah. important during this time. So we, with the payers that we are working with, we are referring. Uh, we have we we understand that their their services that they offer for social determinants, and we refer our coaches and therapists will refer back to those uh, those services. And we are really. Um, trying to get people to connect. So we have social groups in our app and we're connecting people. Uh, this is a really hard time. So we're really trying to make sure we're there for them. We, we actually developed a loneliness uh, program that we're uh, sending out particularly to folks on Medicare. And so just trying what we can to connect people during this time uh, for mm -hmm. social determinants. And then the other question was, um, you can download the app um, you're right. We don't. We don't largely focus on a consumer direct to consumer business. I mean, I think the the majority of that, uh, the rationale for that is that most people in the country expect that these kinds of services are offered by their employers and payers. They expect their healthcare to be covered. So that's why we work with um, businesses, and um, we're, it's it's much easier to actually. Uh, work with a large payer employer and then use eligibility and, and really get to the right individuals who need it most. Uh, and then the other question was, was uh, does Vita provide heart health disease management? So actually most of the individuals we're taking on right now uh, that have diabetes and co-occurring chronic conditions have cardiovascular risk. And so we do have a hypertension uh, program and we do, we have done some work with cardiac rehab and cardiac risk. Uh, if that's the question. Mm -hmm. Um, then there, uh, there's a question about uh, how the data that you're seeing in terms of, you know, you're si you said that depression, um, you're seeing 60% and anxiety in 40%. Does that relate to the engaged users? And if so, how does it translate to the general population? Well, just again, um, you know, we're so typically in the general population, you see 20%, and Jason was referring to this, 20% of people have uh, a mental health condition. It, it's higher now from what we're seeing in the, in the public data. We, the data that, that we refer to in our conversations here is from our enrolled users. So it is, you know, it is people who've chosen to enroll. Um, but, and so, you know, I, but I do think you see, if you look at the data out of CMS and others, they're saying there's an increased incidence of mental health right now during this time. 
Thing. Ilana, why don't you take this question? How is care coordinated between primary care physicians, hospitals, and VITA? Or should, it, is this, should this be directed more towards Stephanie? Um, well, uh, let me answer it almost. Okay. Um, so, it, at least for us, um, the VITA uh, staff and providers um, are reaching the members. But as soon as they need to refer those patients to someone else, either a therapist or for us, it might be our behavioral health providers, they make that connection. Um, or they would make the connection with us and we would make the connection. So mm -hmm. there's a pretty smooth uh, communication between the different entities. Um, you know, generally speaking, when we um, engage partners like VITA to help us coordinate the care for our members, we always want to keep the primary care doc in the center of that and keep that, uh, uh, that physician involved, engaged, and informed of what's going on with the patient. So we, um, we strive very, very uh, hard to not uh, uh, disengage uh, or cause disengagement between the patient and his or her physician. And Jason, I'll come to you. Um, this is just out of curiosity. Does uh, Boeing have any primary care on-site clinics at all, or is it all the traditional way where patients have their own doctors outside of the Boeing system? Yeah, great question. We, we have roughly 11 on-site clinics for occupational health purposes only today. Um, so we do not offer non-occupational health on-site clinics at the moment. Okay. That would include primary care physicians and other services, but it's an area that we continue to assess and monitor as we've seen um, growing market traction in the employer space with bringing non-occupational onsite clinics forward. So the reason I asked was one, there was one question about how do you decide or who decides that a person person could be eligible for a benefit like Vita Health. Yes, that was yeah, so, so uh, I, I, I'll take a crack at it. Um, you know, basically, we, we provide this solution, um, you know, for physical, so it could be, you know, nutrition, preventive nutrition, weight loss, you know, diet, uh, you know, etc. And then on the mental and the, and, and the chronic side, you know, there's there's a number of various solutions that many of which uh, Stephanie touched on already. Um, and it's really up to the member at Boeing to decide what their needs are and through the dialogue that they may have with, let's say they start off with a health coach uh, for physical goals that they want to establish around weight loss. During the course of those interactions, it may turn into um, an opportunity that the member may articulate that they might have around depression and anxiety. So it's really up to the member to first enroll, get engaged, and, you know, work, you know, with, with their VITA partner uh, to, uh, you know, take care of whatever needs they may have across those three areas. And, um, you know, it's member choice at the end of the day. I mean, if they want to go, uh, you know, through, you know, the VITA program, you know, more, more power to them. It's going to be a lot more easier uh, to utilize this type of program on the go virtually, especially in this light of COVID-19, um, and access is there. So, you know, it resonates with our members to take full advantage of that based on what their needs may be. Um, and, and again, there, there's a series of different types of uh, baseline tests up front that VITA will deploy to help that member, I would say, target what their real needs are, and uh, they'll develop a customized program accordingly. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, Stephanie, another question is about the types of mental health practices that you provide through the app uh, is, is, I know you have licensed therapists that people can talk to, but are there mindfulness activities? Uh, what kind of things do you provide if someone doesn't want to talk to someone? That's a great question. So we have subclinical and clinical focus for mental health. So we'll have, we have lots of different programs and they don't necessarily have to engage with the therapist. So you can go through, we have a resilience program that we developed with Shauna Shapiro, who's pretty well known. You can see her TED talks on resilience. We have mindfulness. We have a, a mindfulness-based stress management program uh, that's 
very similar to the mindful ba mindfulness-based stress uh, reduction program at Stanford. Uh, and these are all self, you know, regulated. You can go through them. There's a ton of content. There's meditations. There's video content in the app. Uh, and then in addition to that, you can get therapy. So uh, we so we look at subclinical all the way to clinical. And, you know, we're not trying to... Um, we're really trying to match if you take a PHQ score and you look at, it goes up, you know, we're, the subclinical is usually below five. And so we're trying to make sure we get the right people into the right programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we also, I mean, we've taken a really strong approach of infusing cognitive behavioral therapy concepts throughout all of our programs, because that's really how you drive behavior change and self management of your conditions. You know, chronic disease is prevalent and we want people to really have self-reliance. So that's built throughout all of our programs. And then there was a really interesting question on cultural competence and matching uh, people, users with providers. Um, for example, my parents with very thick Indian accents have, it, have a really tough time understanding thick Latino accents. So how do you match users yeah. with providers? It's like it, we're, we're constantly evolving in this. We have a, a machine learning algorithm where we're, we're really, we're continuing to hone and continuing to expand our provider network to capture more ethnicity, more diversity, uh, and to make sure we are, you know, and look at the age and gender, there's a bunch of different variables. Uh, so we, we look at a, a wide variety and try to get the right person to the right uh, intervention and the right provider. Okay. You know, from a uh, mayor's perspective, I, I would underscore, uh, first of all, the challenge in that uh, it, it is no easy feat to, uh, to be um, you know, to get that right all the time, but we are definitely attempting to and really look carefully at our network of providers to make sure that those uh, providers match uh, the geography that they're in and the patients that, uh, that we send them. So very important. So here's another question for you, uh, Ilana. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit funny, so I'm just going to read it out loud. Okay. Um, it says, Dr. Schrader, what makes the care coordination hands-off smooth? Some still faxing is smooth, for example. I'm sorry, what was the last part of that? Some still think faxing is smooth, for example. Oh, God, <laughs> yes. Um, I have to admit, we do some faxing still. Um, but mostly, um, uh, we do it electronically um, and sometimes by phone. But we really, you know, I'll use the example of Vita and um, our membership and the patients that we have that um, are enrolled in the program. Um, first of all, we look at it as our program. And so we have a program where we address and uh, do our best to take care of by coordinating the care for people who have chronic illnesses of all kinds. And many people, as Stephanie um, acknowledged earlier, have co-occurring chronic illnesses. But we have um, well over 100 care managers across the state who reside in the different appropriate geographies of that state and um, have direct lines to both uh, our members and the patients, as well as our doctors and they interface with them on a regular basis regarding the issues as appropriate, uh, regarding the issues of any given member. So that's what I meant when I said smooth. Okay, <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah. Um, Jason, a question for you. Uh, as a large employer providing wellness services to your members, is there anything that your organization or your members feel is missing that you would like to provide maybe later on? Yeah, you know, I think what we've seen is an evolution with a lot of players in healthcare and well-being from a virtual approach, right? Some have started off with a core competency in one particular area. And um, again, I think the thing that's missing, you know, to simplify that user patient member experience is, is having one simplified experience, one, one, one mobile app, one digital platform that can bring it all home. And, and that's the piece that would really resonated with us when we first discovered Stephanie and Vita was this could do that. Um, and I think as we've seen over the last five years, there has been an evolution with various players in the market today. And Vita's no different where, where they're going to continue to evolve their portfolio of solutions. And that's a great thing because I think it will bring more, you know, solutions to uh, help our members and others. Um, have a simplified 
experience and, and hopefully with really, you know, positive outcomes. So that's, that, that's the thing. And, and when we think about um, where do we want to go, that's really where it's at. And a lot of roadmaps that we've seen and that we've shared our feedback with um, in the market is that's, that's, that's really aspirationally where we want to get to is not having multiple hubs and multiple single, you know, narrow solutions, but ideally one platform that can do everything in a really good way. Um, so that's, that's, you know, maybe more aspirational, but, you know, Vita, Vita is really front and center when we think about the multitude of chronic preventive and physical solutions that we can leverage all in one today. So uh, this one's for you, Stephanie. How does Vita compare with Omada and Livongo and their chronic management offerings? You get a chance to <laughs> throw some mud at your competitors. Go ahead. Uh, that's a good one. I'm sure that's maybe one of their competitors is online. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, you know, I'll just start from the, the beginning of um, why I started the company. That might make more sense. Uh, so um, I spent a long time in tech. I was at eBay and Google for a long time and building products that scaled to millions of consumers and um, was used to doing everything on my phone. And my father was sick and he had multiple chronic conditions. So he had diabetes, obesity, and of course they're very much correlated. And then um, he had COPD and uh, CHF and they were more mild. And then he had depression. And so I was just really struggling with why isn't there like this really simple solution for him where there's remote monitoring, there's coaching, there's accountability, there's a connection to his PCPs. He had all these different doctors he was seeing. And it was so, um, I, I couldn't believe that nothing existed in this space. And there was no, you know, everything, every other consumer space has been um, Amazonized, if you will, or built into a very consumer friendly experience. And I just didn't see that in healthcare. So that's so, and from the beginning, I, I thought to myself, you really need to have one place, and an individual doesn't want to have five apps one for hypertension, one for diabetes, one for mental health, <laughs> one for COPD, one. It would just be too much. He, would, he wouldn't do that, right? So it, it came, we started from the beginning of a, with a polychronic by design approach, really trying to meet the person where they're at and handle their multiple conditions and have all their health data in one place that can be then shared with the PCP. Um, so I think that's how we're unique. And, you know, I don't know the depths of all our competitors and all that. I'm not going to go through <laughs> each one of them. Um, but we did start from a, a different place. And we are, um, we also have built a really strong network of providers across 50 states. And so we're able to cover um, a wide range of, of individuals for, for large employers and payers. I just have a fact, and correct me again, uh, Vita, if, if I'm wrong. If I remember correctly, uh, Livongo and Omada started in diabetes and then added pieces, including the mental health. Vita had mental health from the start, correct? We did. We built it. Um, we built it in the in the in the second year of the company. Yeah, we started with um, uh, cardiometabolic syndrome, like. Mm -hmm. And we, we did cardiac rehab and diabetes and, and uh, coaching for mental health came second because really what happened is, and we knew we wanted to build it, but we started, we had to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I knew from the beginning that you had to have it in one place because of my father's experience. And then what we actually saw was a lot of the patients we had, had co-occurring chronic conditions and co-occurring anxiety and depression. And we literally had our coaches and RDs coming to us and saying, I can't treat the diabetes without treating the depression. And so we had, to, we had to go very fast to get the depression in place. And that's when we built cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so so. Um, staying with you, you know, um, for any digital health startup, whether to integrate with the EHR or not is always a big question. So there's a question uh, from the audience that says, does the Vita app share data with any of the electronic medical records in the market? We do share data back. We have uh, we share data back with PCPs, um, we uh, and and other providers. Um, we we don't we haven't done like in depth like when you say integrate with a medical uh, medical EMR EHR you have to you can go very deep into Epic or Cerner. We haven't done that because it's not necessary, and it just doesn't it doesn't add enough value at this point. Um, really, what doctors want to know is they want to know. Since the last time I saw the patient, how is their A1C moved? How is their blood glucose looking? How is their weight? Like all these metrics, and we can easily share that with the doctor. 
So I want to bring the discussion back to mental health a, a little bit and telemedicine, both of which are squarely in the spotlight right now because of COVID. Um, how, I mean, we have looked at the reimbursement scenario very positively because all these years we're reporting on, oh, digital health is great, but it's not moving the needle, you know, payers are not reimbursing the same rate. And now with COVID, everything overnight seemed to work so quickly and all the barriers were removed. So we are capable of reimbursing. We are capable. <laughs> <laughs> now the question is, is the uh, cow out of the barn and can't close the door anymore? I can't imagine people coming back and saying, we're not gonna reimburse tele telemedicine, uh, mental health for mental health or other things once the pandemic, well, once it's so hard to say once when, you're, when we're setting records every day, but when, hopefully soon, um, this thing gets more under control. I don't know, Elena, Lana, yeah, you, you want you, me to address yeah, that? You I, might be I, 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 I yeah. know you, my perspective, but yours would be yeah. more interesting. <laughs> well, it's actually a great opportunity for me to underscore a couple of points that were already made, because uh, I think we, we've got some really interesting data as well. So um, I believe that less than 1% of our medical costs um, earlier, even as recent as earlier this year, um, were related to virtual visits of any sort. And moving forward to date, uh, we now have 26% of our medical costs um, for virtual visits. Very interesting, obviously a huge, huge increase. And obviously also Stephanie, just uh, as you described a little while ago, we're actually seeing, you know, we saw um, a peak probably mid-April, at least here in Florida. Um, or, I'm sorry, not mid-April, uh, mid-May. And then it's gone down a little bit. But to your question, Arundhati, um, I think this is here to stay because I think that the crisis has certainly unleashed uh, what is clearly consumer interest in virtual care, which I think is great. Um, gives more access um, and you know, obviously uh, for convenience and, um, and all the things that it does, it, it, it is uh, really tr a tremendous uh, tool in our toolbox that is becoming that much more prevalent. Um, so the first thing that we did, again, in the uh, environment of the crisis is we made sure to offer uh, our virtual services with no cost shares. So we made sure that everybody had access uh, to the services as needed and because people couldn't leave their houses, right? So we wanted them to stay home. They, they were scared to go out. Uh, so we made sure that all of those services were available. We also um, did that through all of our network providers and enabled all of our network providers for virtual care. So even in the clinics that are Guidewell clinics, um, all of our clinics are now virtually enabled. One of our clinics even had, during the time of the crisis, 90% of their visits was, were virtual, 90%. Um, which is, you know, an, uh, an unbelievable number. Interestingly, behavioral health was dis disproportionately high rel um, in terms of their virtual care relative to their overall care during this crisis. So I said 26% before for uh, behavioral health, it's over 30%. So obviously, um, especially in behavioral health, virtual care is absolutely necessary. We are looking to continue that service. Um, I'll be honest, we haven't quite figured out uh, the exact um, uh, technicalities of reimbursement. Um, you know, there, there are obviously different schools of thought, one being that, uh, the, um, that the payments should be exactly the same as in-office visits, and the other school of thought that thinks it should be discounted. And then within that second school of thought, uh, discounted by varying degrees if it's virtual relative to um, in office visits. And we're still trying to figure that out. Um, but in summary, um, we are looking to expand the services that we provide through virtual, not contract them, um, but also make sure that uh, the services that do need to be physical and on site uh, remain accessible. So that's so how this might be a little bit of an extreme question here, but staying with you, Ilana. If we reimburse at the same level and there's great appetite for reimbursement at the same level as an in-person visit, do we not create a scenario where doctors will do virtual visits when they actually should be seeing someone in person? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. That's why we're not in favor of that um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, because the, it is mixed, right? We, we need both. Um, and there are times, I think we would all agree, 
there are times when it's absolutely essential that people have a live in-person visit with his or her doctor. Um, and we do not want to, um, to discourage that in any way. But then on the other hand, if I'm thinking about access, especially in rural areas where, you know, you, it's so hard for someone to drive however many miles to find someone, True. for them, it's, you know, you get access yep. to even specialty care. Uh, if it's medicine. So, right. So all of those things have to be taken into account. And, you know, uh, some amount of flexibility, I think, is going to be required. I'm glad I'm not in regulator's shoes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stephanie, I'll go back to uh, some uh, questions from the audience. Can a member in the program be engaged with multiple therapists, say three to four at the same time? Uh, well, we typically have uh, a provider for each condition. So if you have diabetes, like you have an RD or a CDE, if you have uh, if you're in therapy, you would have one therapist. Um, if you need to switch or you need another therapist, we can do that. Uh, we typically measure the therapeutic alliance and see if the relationship is working and if they're getting outcomes. Uh, but you know, there's not as many instances where you need three or four therapists. Uh, to Alana's point, we agree that there are some instances where you need to refer offline and we will refer. Um, so at Boeing, for example, we are referring offline uh, and getting people an appointment within uh, you know, hopefully a 10 mile radius if they're close uh, to providers and then making sure they get an appointment within a week. So I, I agree with Alana's statement. I think there's a hybrid model here that's really important. Some things need to be held in, you know, handled in person and a lot can be done virtually. And I think getting that, that optimal uh, structure is really gonna be important for the healthcare system at large. And then there's a question again uh, for you, Stephanie, from Christine. Uh, how do you reach members in the first place to engage with them? Through which channels and what type of content do you provide? Well, we do a lot of different marketing. Uh, we, we, uh, we send emails. We do on-site events. Uh, we partner with our employers and payers to look at the best channels for them. Uh, we'll use uh, uh, mailers to the home. Uh, we use Obviously, everyone's using social media these days, uh, and um, we have you know, outreach through calls. I mean, there's we use every every actually marketing vehicle available to us in in a population. Jason, I'll come back to you. Um, I haven't asked you something in a while, so both um, Ilana and Stephanie talked about the social determinants of health, and I'm wondering, as a large employer, do you see that as something that you need to address, or do you think it's mostly uh, for providers and, and payers to sort of look at? Yeah, no, it's a shared responsibility. Um, we fully expect our partners across our benefit supply chain to work with us and identify opportunities to do better on social determinants of health. And we've been doing, we, we've had a focus on this area for a few years now, and it, it, it continues and, you know, the, the, the single thing that I think is, is really opportunistic for all of us, um, not just on this call, but beyond is, you know, looking at how we can do better around diversity and inclusion. When we think about zip code being the leading factor of disparity on access and longevity um, for lifespans and stuff like that, you know, how, how can we bridge those gaps and disparities in a positive way together? and um, you know, more acutely focus on, on those opportunities holistically. So those are, those are efforts. I mean, when we look at our, our members, we have a very diverse mix uh, you know, of, of, of people that are in urban, suburban, and rural locations. So it really does vary greatly on how we can improve access and uh, help, help you know, everyone out in, in, in a positive way. Ilana, this is a question for you. Do you anticipate that total spend on behavioral health will be significantly increased given the uptake seen for virtual behavioral health, even if reimbursement is discounted? Well, you know, I'd actually, um, I do think that the expenses for behavioral health will go up. Um, I actually think that's a good thing. I think it is undertreated now. And I think that uh, we want more people to get treated for their behavioral health issues. So um, I don't see that, I see that as a positive. So we're coming close to the top of the hour. I wanted each of you to um, sort of talk about what you've learned in these last six months that seem 
I don't know, as long as a year. Um, and then maybe we can take a couple of last questions from the audience. Stephanie, I'll go with you. I, I've just been blown away uh, by human resilience in this country and how fast people are innovating uh, to solve quick problems. So, you know, the country's moved to virtual so fast <laughs> and uh, in both Florida Blue and, and, and Guidewell and, and Boeing have done that too. And we've all embraced change and uh, I'm, I'm just impressed with our whole country for how fast we've moved, at least the people on this call. <laughs> I think we've done, I think we've moved fast. <laughs> Um, you know, I think we've learned so much from this uh, really awful time, actually. Um, we've learned about virtual care. Um, we've learned how to put that in place and the incredible interest in it by consumers. We've also learned that uh, minorities have been disproportionately impacted uh, uh, relative to this virus and have had to really look under the covers at why, um, especially in this envi environment of um, uh, at the, uh, social injustice that we're, that we're all dealing with. And I think really gives us an opportunity to address issues that uh, we had heretofore um, maybe been afraid or not known to address. So uh, it's been a very interesting learning uh, mm -hmm. time for I think all of us in many uh, regards. It's funny you mentioned that because I think there's some, just a few days ago I was seeing a Twitter thread which said, um, Social determinants of health is just a fancy word for systemic racism, which I struck a nerve <laughs> for, yeah. me for sure. Well, I, I will add, I, it is striking. I think we all knew this, but the data for individuals with COVID is just, is overwhelming. Right? Oh, so yeah. it's overwhelming and it's right. really, it, it just, it needs, it, it's a catalyst for us all to act. Right. Minorities. Not, people are not washing their hands, right? As, as one person put it very inartfully uh, yeah. a few days ago, but go ahead. Exactly. I was going to say that the death rate for people with minorities uh, from COVID is double, at least. And that's probably underreported uh, right. relative to everybody else. So. And that's right. tied to underlying chronic disease. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly. Exactly. I think one of the things that made, was stark for me is that this is the richest, our nation is the richest and, and you know, most prosperous, prosperous in the world, but individually we're an unhealthy lot. You know, that, that was quite striking. Yeah. Um, Jason, any parting words of wisdom? Jason, can you hear us? He may, may not be able to hear us anymore. He probably yeah. has some. Um, yeah, he probably has a hard time. But we'll, well, we have an all-female <laughs> cast now. So um, I guess I wanted to say that, you know, thank you to the health team for um, organizing this uh, and um, Stephanie and Ilana for patiently uh, working through. This was my first virtual um, Zoom session oh. moderation. So. <laughs> Mine too. Mine too. Uh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> See, it works. And, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you very much to the audience. I think the questions were very, very on point and um, prompted us to, to think. So thank you again. I'm going to uh, send this back to the health team. Thank you so much, Arundhati, and to all of our panelists. If you'd like to join us in continuing the conversation, please join us on Twitter using the hashtag on the screen. And now I'd like to introduce our yogi for the afternoon, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Um, for those who are staying for the yoga session, thank you so much to the health team for inviting me here to guide you in just a small practice together. Um, wherever you are, I want you to find a seat. If you can sit on the floor, that would be great. Um, if sitting cross-legged is really uncomfortable, then uh, maybe just having your feet planted out in front of you, maybe sitting up on a pillow or something to have your hips elevated above your knees would be really great as well. And we'll just start with our hands face down on our legs for a moment and close down the eyes for a couple of deep breaths together. Let's take a deep breath in through the nose, so all the way up. And open the mouth, exhale. Again, deep breath in through the nose, so all the way up. And open the mouth, let it go. 
And one more time, deep breath in through the nose. Full breath out. And you can seal your lips and just return your breath to normal. And take a moment to observe your body. Allow all the information you just received to exist, but just take your focus to any sensations happening in the body. We gently start to flicker open the eyes. We'll stretch the arms up overhead. And on the exhale, we're gonna twist over to the right. So your left hand's gonna to come to the outside of your right knee. Your right hand is behind you. Try to keep your spine up really nice and tall so your heart's reaching forward. Your gaze can stay forward or maybe you turn the chin towards your right shoulder if that's all right on the neck. Each inhale, find length with the spine. And each exhale, twist just a little more. And start to come back to center with a big inhale. And on the exhale, twist to the other side, right hand to the outside of your left knee, left hand behind you like a little kickstand. Each inhale, find length. Each exhale to twist. Inhale again. Stay for the twist and exhale. And start to come back to center, stretch your arms up overhead. And then we'll take the hands down and in front of you and roll onto the hands and knees to find your way to a tabletop shape. So just stacking your wrists under your elbows, under your shoulders, and your hips are over your knees here. Try not to lock out your elbows here. So get yourself really nice and strong in the arms. Long spine gaze just slightly out and in front of you. On your inhale, lower the belly as you lift your gaze and tailbone for a cow spine. On your exhale, press the ground away as you hollow out the belly, take your gaze to your navel. Inhale, heart reaches forward as you gaze up. Exhale to round the spine, press up and away for cat. And one more time, inhale, heart reaches forward, spine curves. Exhale to round through the spine. Good, and take a few more deep breaths here. So maybe you keep going through that linear movement of cow to cat, or maybe you start to move the hips from side to side, anything that feels nice in the body. Again, you're not on video, you can get really weird with it if you like. If it feels good to flutter out the lips and let some tension go from the face, you can do that as well. And once you've moved around, evened out your movements. I'm gonna take the big toes to touch, knees out a little bit wider as you send your hips towards your heels for a child's pose. So let your forehead relax on the mat. Your palms can relax down on the mat. Maybe you take just to gently rock your forehead from side to side. Massage of the third eye center to release any lingering thoughts, expectations, judgments. And start to draw yourself back up through your tabletop. We'll tuck your toes, lift your hips up and back. Find a quick downward facing dog. We're not gonna stay here for very long, but I want you to find a little bend into your knees so that we'll start to walk your hands back to your feet just for a forward fold at the back of your mat. Now make sure your knees stay bent so you're not stressing out your hamstrings or your low back here. And if your hands don't reach the floor, no problem at all. Just let your arms kind of dangle, let your head dangle as well. Shake your yes and no. If it feels good, you can also grab opposite elbows here to create a little more weight. Again, try not to lock out your knees, bend them as much as you need to so your heart is reaching towards your knees here. Maybe you find a moment to kind of sway side to side. And then release your hands down. We're just gonna take a deep bend into your left knee. Place your left, left fingertips down and in front of you as you peel your right arm up for a twist. So try to keep the spine nice and long so your heart is reaching forward. Crown of the head reaching forward. Take a deep breath in here. And exhale, re reach your right hand back down to replace your left deep bend into the right knee this time as you peel your left arm high. Maybe your gaze stays forward. Maybe it goes up to the left fingertip. Take a deep breath in here. 
and then exhale, left hand can come down. Walk your hands forward here. And then we'll just come back down to the knees and send your hips onto your heels. Now, if it's wildly uncomfortable to sit on your heels in this way, you can find a regular seat, or again, maybe you sit up on a pillow or a towel behind your knees, um, can feel really nice as well. So moving into some heart opening here, which helps to energize the spine. So if you're feeling kind of sluggish in your day and you need a little bit of a pick-me-up, to a little bit of heart opening, and take the hands to the base of the spine, palms facing um, the low back here, fingertips facing down toward the floor. Now roll your elbows toward one another like they're little wings coming together and press down into the hips as you simultaneously start to take your gaze upward and shine your heart upward. Now think less of leaning back in space and more of lifting up from the heart, rolling the shoulder blades toward one another. Good, take a deep breath in. And then just release, take your hands to your heart center, tuck your chin, take a deep breath. And full breath out. I'll do that again. Palms to the base of the spine, right at the top of the hip bones there. Pressing down to the hips, up from the heart. Elbows rolling toward one another. Maybe your gaze goes further up to the ceiling. Keep your low belly still pretty engaged here so you're protecting the spine here. Take your one deep breath. And then gently release, hands to heart center, tuck your chin, deep breath in. Full breath out. I'll try this one more time. So you have the option to keep the hands at the base of the spine, or maybe you just walk the fingertips right behind you a little bit. If you wanna find a little more space, we'll roll the shoulder blades in toward one another as you lift from the heart space. Good, maybe the gaze goes upward. Try not to surrender the neck back so you can still breathe really easily here. Good, one more deep breath. And then gently release, come back, hands to heart center, tuck your chin. And we'll slide the heels out from underneath you as you find your way back to a seat. Take your right foot, your right knee is going to be bent here, right foot to the inside of your left thigh, left leg is nice and long beside you. Take your left hand to the inside of your leg, so almost like you're gonna reach for the foot. Wherever on the leg you can reach for it, just make sure it's on the inside. As you start to rotate your torso to the right, and we'll start to reach your right arm up overhead. Now, you wanna feel this in the bottom right of your side here, so almost down to the hips. And the further you reach with your left hand, the more you're gonna reach that, or feel that stretch on the right side. This is really great if we've been sitting a lot, it helps to open up the low back. Take deep breaths into the side body, don't forget to breathe. And try not to collapse down here, try to keep the heart open up. And slowly start to come back up. Now we'll rotate your torso towards your left leg. If it feels good, you can have a little bend into that left leg as well. We'll take a deep breath in and then fold the torso over your left leg. Maybe you grab onto the calf, maybe it's the foot, maybe it's behind the thigh here. But go ahead and let your forehead relax down. Maybe you feel that stretch into the right side of the back here. Good, one more deep breath in. And deep breath out. Slowly start to come back to center. And I'll just switch out the leg. So we'll take the left foot in, right leg comes out to the side. Little bend into the knee is always super welcome here. So we always wanna be really generous with our hamstrings um, all the way up to our low back. And taking your right hand to the end of your right leg. So maybe to the calf, maybe to the foot if you got it, great. If not, bring it back up, no problem. We'll try to rotate your left shoulder open, left rib cage open. Stretch your left arm up overhead, almost like you're gonna reach your fingertips to your right toes. Might not happen today, maybe tomorrow. Each inhale, find length. 
Each exhale to fold, keep shining the heart upward here. And slowly start to come back to center, stretch the arms up and then re-rotate to the right side. Maybe you deepen the bend into the right knee just to give yourself some grace there. Take a deep breath and fold over the right leg. So maybe you grab the foot, maybe behind the calf. Each inhale, find length with the heart. And each exhale to fold, you can surrender the forehead down. Take one more deep breath in. And a deep breath out. And slowly start to come back up. And we'll take the soles of the feet together and your knees out wide like a butterfly, or your baddha konasana, if you will. Hands can interlace around your feet or maybe grab onto your ankles. Try to keep your spine nice and tall, try not to round here. We'll inhale to lengthen from the heart and then fold forward over the legs. Now think about sending the hips back, reaching the heart forward. So only go as far as you can before your shoulders start to round in here. Try to keep those nice and drawn down the back. Take a deep breath. Deep breath out. And gently start to come back up. Use your hands to close the knees together. Now, feet are planted down into the ground. Hands to the tops of the shins or the knees here. On your inhale, we'll guide the heart up and through, arching the back, looking up. On the exhale, round the spine, extend the arms, get in between your shoulder blades. And again, pull the heart through, arch the back, look up. And exhale, round to extend, tuck the chin. One more time, inhale, arch the back and look up. And exhale, round and extend. Come back up, just extend both legs out and in front of you. Soften into the knees again, always super welcome here. Stretch the arms up overhead, deep breath. On your exhale, fold over the legs and grab onto whatever's available. So maybe it's the feet, maybe behind the calves, the knees. Each inhale, find length with the heart reaching forward. And each exhale, fold just a little bit. Put one more deep breath in here. And a deep breath out. Slowly start to come back up. You have the option if you want to come to lie down or just find a seat for a few breaths together as we close this out. Wherever you are, if you're seated, you can close down the eyes. If you're lying down, maybe you take a hand to the heart or to the belly, or if you're seated as well, you can do that. Find a little bit of connection. Close down the eyes. Can you allow your jaw to soften? Allow your tongue to fall away from the roof of the mouth. Allow the space between your eyebrows to relax and unfurl. Always knowing that you can come back to this place, to this practice, to find a renewal of energy and of connectedness. Let's take a deep breath in together. A full breath out of the mouth. You can bring your hands to heart center. Draw your thumbs up to your third eye. Thank you so much for sharing this practice with me. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Stephanie. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.